This is The Cliff Yates Show. Personal growth, motivation, inspiration, and philosophies for a great life. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Cliff Yates Show. You're in the right place, and I'm so honored and happy I have a special guest today. And I can actually say, after talking with him, I have a new friend. And uh, this man is uh, making, uh, I'm going to say, another run for mayor of Amesbury, Massachusetts. And uh, we have a lot in common. We met through a mutual friend. And uh, I'll let you get to know him personally by introducing him. His name is Ted Semezny. I hope I said that right, Ted. You did. Very good. Yes. Uh, very difficult name. It, it sounds easier than it looks. And so you're running for mayor. This is the third time? That is correct. But, you know, first of all, thank you, Cliff, for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here and for giving me this opportunity to speak. But yes, this, this is the third time I'm running. Um, I've lived in Amesbury, a, a wonderful community in the northeast corner of Massachusetts, right on the border with New Hampshire. A perfect location, uh, you know, 10 minutes from the ocean. We're close to the mountains, beautiful mountains of Vermont, uh, New Hampshire. And, and coastal Maine, but at the same time, you're only about 45 minutes from Boston. And Amesbury is a classic, uh, you know, you know, old manufacturing town. It's got wonderful history with, it was once uh, most known for being the carriage capital of the world uh, back in the late 1800s. Um, so a very rich history. Um, if you drive through it right now, beautiful downtown, beautiful uh, images of that past. We have a lot of mill buildings. Uh, the community has really gone through a, a rebirth, like a lot of communities, old mill manufacturing facilities uh, and, uh, and communities uh, with, you know, these, these old buildings being converted to housing to now small businesses. It's a very walkable, family-friendly community that I love being in. As I said, I've been there since 2004. Um, and I first ran in 2011. Uh, then 2019, and now this is my third crack at it here in 2023. Great. I, I, we're going to have to visit that area and uh, go through there because we're we're not too far around our island in upstate New York. So I'm, I'm pro I imagine we're probably maybe three or four hours, probably four hours, five hours away. Yeah, it would be there. a beautiful drive through upstate New York, uh, Green Mountains of Vermont, New Hampshire, down in, as I said, into the right into Massachusetts there of Amesbury. So I'm interested because we grew up in similar uh, areas in upstate New York. And then I read, and you can explain this. So you didn't know anything about the community, just were driving through, and it was so, in, you, you, you felt motivated to move there. Yeah, absolutely. So just a very brief background. Uh, like you, I grew up near <clears throat> Buffalo, New York. Uh, went to uh, undergraduate school there nearby in Fredonia. Then moved down to uh, my first real job out of college. Philadelphia was there for three years. Went down to the Washington, D.C. area, from, uh, went to Univer University of Maryland, was, was working for the Census Bureau. Uh, but then, um, you know, moved up here to Massachusetts. Um, my first wife grew up in uh, Massachusetts, so we we're like, okay, we're ready to settle down. And I remember, you know, I got a job with the uh, um, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. And I remember, I'll never forget, I, would, I, I didn't know anything about Massachusetts, the region, and we were interested in starting a family, uh, settling down, buying a house. And I would just at my lunch period, I would drive around to each community in, in the area and just get a feel for it. None of them felt right until I, I, I remember, never forget the day I drove into Amesbury. And immediately, it's just one of those things that just hit you. I, I got chills. I said, I knew for a fact we were going to live here. This was where we we're going to move. Wow. I love the layout of the community. Um, it's just very... It's a perfect size. It's about we got about seventeen thousand people, but I but I already explained the beautiful history. You could see it, gorgeous downtown, and I remember walk driving around, be like, wow, wouldn't it be great, say, if they had great neighborhood schools? And as soon as that, that thought popped in my head, there was a elementary school right there, or the high school was right there that kids like in the old days could walk to, and they do here in Amesbury. And then I was like, wow, but what about recreation? And then I turn a corner. I'm, I'm in this beautiful open space. I was like, I was just in a downtown. And two minutes later, I'm out in like, looks like farm fields, rural. It was just gorgeous. And I just knew that this was going to be the place that we were going to, that I was going to live. That seems like a perfect size. I grew up, as you know, in, uh, in those little villages. Our village of Caledonia was uh, 4,000, 3,000 to 4,000, which was great, but a little too small, Seventeen. 
thousand seems just about right. I think uh, when I think, because uh, I was a deputy in uh, out of Geneseo, New York. I think Geneseo, when the when college is in session, is a around 12 so i think 17 seems like just a perfect and did you recently was i reading it went from a township to a city now or yeah that's uh yeah that was back in the late uh 1990s it, uh, oh okay it, it went to more of a city form of government ah, and okay. you know seventeen thousand. yeah we're one of if not the small we're, we're probably like the second or third smallest official city in Ma- massachusetts with wow. the mayor so that's you know that's one of the reasons why um this election is so important because with a community of our size, 17,000, the, the mayor's office um, uh, wields an enormous amount of power when you're talking about a community of that size. So, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, you know, one of the reasons why, I've, you know, this is the third time I'm running. I really, truly believe in uh, people getting involved in politics, running for office. I think that is the best way for people to um take control of their democracy of of yes of reclaiming their communities uh that's one of my taglines reclaim amesbury and to me that is the core of people being proactive not just with their lives reclaiming their lives but reclaiming their community so i'm a big believer in people running for office i would love nothing nothing more to have a lot of competition for a lot of people running for all the offices that we have and that's not just mayor it's uh city council it's school committee yeah a planning board these are all very critical things um, yeah. and this is the best way for people to really become knowledgeable about um, issues that are important to our lives because you know we obviously national politics dominates things but in a lot of ways local politics is very different uh, the issues that are important to a, a, a you know a typical voter here in Amesbury or pretty much any most communities if you're running for mayor it really boils down to this in a nutshell who is the most qualified who can control property taxes the most the most while at the same time maintaining a healthy school budget i mean that those twin issues and again that is a very difficult thing it's not easy um and once people get into it and they and they they run for city council or they're on the planning board you realize the complexities of government uh and um and what is what it takes to really run a community and it takes people coming together it takes people working together as a team yes. so i am a, absolutely a unifier i'm an independent love it um but i truly you know one of my taglines is um together we can do extraordinary things i truly I like believe it. that yeah i truly believe that in my heart i could talk to anybody and i want to talk to anybody no matter where they are on the political spectrum have empathy for where they're coming from um, we all, at the end of the day, you know, no matter who you support for national politics or at the local level, most people are good in their hearts. They just want the best for their lives, their children, their communities. That's As I right. said, control property taxes. We're all going through difficult times with inflation and the cost of living. Uh, we need robust debates to figure out the best way at the at the local community level. That's where it begins. Controlling taxes, yeah. maintaining a school budget while doing everything else that needs to be done. Yeah, they say all politics is is local. Yeah, and that yeah. who can be more qualified than you, really? I mean, uh, so if I got this right, you have degrees economics, political science, public management, economic development, and you've been on the planning board in Amesbury for what eight years? Or? Yeah, I was on the planning board in eight years until uh, two thousand. Let's see, till two thousand and so from two thousand nine to two thousand seventeen. Wow, that's that's yeah, great. And, and then so, uh, I I like uh, you you mentioned once that. Uh, if you can't, uh, was there something that was like a broken pavement or something right outside the city hall or something? If we can't start there, where can we, where can we start? Right. There's the little things of uh, yeah, you know, okay. getting things fixed and. Right. I, I, exactly. So as I said, it. I mean, there there are many layers. Well, well, to yes, to to follow up on my qualifications, you know. I, yeah, I please, am please do. I know I, confident that, and I know I'm the most qualified person running for mayor based on my extensive background not just in the public sector uh and volunteering for positions being elected uh official but being in the private sector as well uh but more importantly not just my you know sort of straight up uh degrees and where i've worked but sort of my life experiences and i hope to get into that i think a a little bit later once we we move on to sort of uh the, the the core issues from a from a management perspective about what 
sort of drives me at a deeper level about why I want yeah. to run for mayor uh, beyond my qualifications and, and beyond being passionate about wanting to help, again, as I said, control property taxes, which are, you know, always, uh, which are very much a big issue in Amesbury. And, and we're, we're we face big school budget challenges. But as you said, you know, sort of that second layer is then, OK, we've got crumbling infrastructure and who can best develop a plan to to deal with the, you know, the crumbling sidewalks at best or lack of sidewalks, the, you know, the, the, the condition of our roads, water, sewer, uh, but at the same time, maintaining a, a healthy level of fire department, police department, everything else. And then at that third level, I would put those things, infrastructure, police, fire, um, at the second level after property taxes and, and the school budget, the first level, the third level that a mayor and, and communities need to deal with is sort of that quality of life issues. Um, and again, I sort of hinted at that when I first drove into Amesbury, how I fell in love with the community, the feel for it, the, yeah. uh, the, you know, the walkability of it, but, you know, dealing with open space concerns, making sure we have good open space and, 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 and good, uh, sporting facilities, you know, uh, we, for a long time have been trying to make sure we have, uh, enough baseball fields and, and soccer fields, um, all of those things. And then adding to that. I, you know, I'm a big uh, supporter of things such as farmers markets, uh, getting, you know, you know, people involved in those type of activities to improve the quality of life and, and our personal health. There's so many ways we can do do that. And, and the more we can get people involved and working together as a team, um, the better that is. Yeah. And I really appreciate the fact that you, you know, and we're all about here, the personal growth, self-improvement and the taking control of our power. What, what can we do right now? And so you just didn't see problems and want to run for mayor. You've already been serving. So where can you serve right now? You're on the planning board. You're seeing how things are going. So, I mean, you're already embedded in service to the community. I think that's, that's great. You're going now, you want to go to a next level, but you're already serving the community already. Right. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, you know, there are, there are so many great people out there in each community and there's a lot of people in amesbury and a lot of other communities that are qualified that could run for mayor that could run for office with with great education diverse backgrounds they have the skill but to me the most important thing is is a person's attitude um it doesn't matter to me, the most uh, important uh, determinant of, of a person being successful in life, and I think what is the, the heart of, of your podcast and, and why I appreciate people like you, uh, thank you, thank you, putting a podcast like this out, because I think this type of messaging is very important. Yes. It doesn't matter your degree. At the end of the day, what's much more important than your degrees, your education, your experience, your looks, uh, how much money you have. The most important thing is a person's base attitude, and number one is their level of perseverance. Right. Um, one of the one of the best uh, compliments anybody ever gave me, I, I took as a compliment, is is somebody we know, my wife and I know, and they said, you know what, Ted, you are like a wind up toy. Um, you know those old school when we were kids, you would you would you know those little, little toy cars, you would, yeah. you would wind it up, it would, it would it would go real fast, it would hit a wall. But then it would bounce off and would, and it would go right back, and it would hit yeah. another wall. But it just kept going and kept going. Yeah. And I guess you could take that as, as a negative. But I took that as a positive. And I said, you know what? That really is at, at the core of who I am that, yeah, I'm, you know, I, this is the third time I'm running for mayor. Although I would say this is the first time I feel I can truly put my all into it. Yeah. Uh, there were very cir very circumstances in my life that prevented me for the first two times from fully being, being able to, to do it the right way. I'm doing it the right way this time. I know what it takes. You know, that experience running the first two times was very helpful. Um, so I feel very confident about this time. But again, Great. at the base, that perseverance of no matter yeah. what, yeah. Give, you, giving you you, 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 you hit failure. We're all going to hit failures in life, but you get up and you keep trying. You be flexible. And even at the end of the day, and again, as, as I said, I'm very confident in, that I'm going to win this election. But even yes. if things don't work out that way, right? I can. I'll be able to put my head, to go to bed at night, correct, and be yeah. proud of my effort, and say, you know what? It just wasn't meant to be, and that That's would right. be fine. And yeah. you know, the last time I ran, 
again, um, I, I happen to lose in the preliminary round, but you know, up to that point, you know, it, it is exhausting to run in an election. Oh, I did, yeah. you know, I was doing the door to door thing, July and August, hundred degree heat going door to door. Uh, at the same time, maintaining a family, I've got four kids uh, living in my household, a wife, a big, big house. I got a regular job. So you're doing all these things. It, the, it is an exhausting experience. And then on the day of the election, you know, I'm, I'm literally standing there for 13 hours at the polling wow. place, yeah. never leaving since so seven in the morning till eight at night until the polls close. Yeah. Exhausted. Uh, and then the, and then at eight o'clock right away, you know, it takes about 10 minutes to hear the results. Yeah. And I, and again, I'll never forget, uh, it's about eight ten. again, just drained. I just found out that I lost oh. and out of nowhere. I, I don't know what this, the, the, the reporter must've been hiding in the walls or something <laughs> immediately. When I find out I lose, it's like the first thing, there's a microphone in my face from this reporter. And you know what, what I said there is, is is legitimately my philosophy and i said you know what life goes on that's I'm right out of my effort yeah. i i feel like i represented a voice in this community that wasn't being heard by typical leaders in a community and i'm proud of that and and i said you yeah. know what i can i could be proud of my effort and as i said life goes on you know it's not the worst thing in the world that that didn't happen but i'm proud of that i did it my way just like this time um you know i'm not a typical politician I don't play, you know, if I played the typical political games, maybe I'd have an easier road, but I know myself, I can't do that. I am a, first and foremost, I'm a truth seeker. Correct. Which, yeah. Which can rub a lot of people the wrong way, yes. but that's just who I am. And I'm going to do it that way no matter what. I will not betray my principles, what I believe in. I will not apologize yes. for anything or anybody I support. Um, and but I am going to work as hard as I possibly can, do everything I can. And if at the end of the day it doesn't work out, hey, I know that I'm, a, I'm still a winner, uh, that it, it was a great effort, that I, I'm spreading, uh, hopefully spreading a lot of positivity out there because I want to inspire people to um, you know, get involved and, and not be afraid yeah. of politics. You know, Too many people are afraid to get involved. I, my, I want my campaign to show you can get involved we can speak from different points of view and just find common ground. Right. That's interesting because uh, I, I studied Stoicism, which uh, a lot I was and I was reading of a guy who got a degree in philosophy and he, he studied all the all the philosophies. But he, what he liked about a lot of the philosophies were like solo. You were you, were, you got yourself out of society and the Stoicism had uh, it, it promoted you being involved in the community, but focusing on what you had control of. And so it wanted you to get involved. Uh, it had like two pillars to start with that we, first we are different from, we can reason, number one, and number two, we'll, we're social. And so what what do what can we do? What do we have? Well, we, we can, we can uh, research the politicians or we can run ourselves. We can find out who's the best person to vote for. And we can vote for them. Now, after that, we gotta we have to see what happens. But we can be involved in the community in that way. And so I, I like that uh, you have that similar philosophy. Yeah, no, I mean, I truly believe that, um, you know, the health of our democracy, the health of our society is all dependent on the energy that us average people put into it. I think, for, and what I saw, you know, I, you know, running for mayor and everything, Again, in addition to the fear, un unfortunately, that we need to kind of break out of, of people speaking out and, 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 and getting involved is just related to that is just, you know, I, I think just too many people have this idea that democracy is a spectator sport. Yeah. That you sit back, you sit back and you pop, you pop some popcorn and you watch the two warring factions. Yeah. That's not democracy. And, no. and even voting, which is hard enough as it is, you think voting rates at the national level is. It, it is it can be depressed that that, that can be the the most devastating thing yeah. when you see you give it your all and it's not so much the enemies you see in front of you the the enemies um or you know the people that you're fighting it's sort of just the general you know people can't even too many people just can't even find the time to vote and it's just like i know yeah you know you're gonna complain about everything but you know just but even voting is not enough. You really need to 
our democracy, it, it's only going to be as strong as people put into it and actually get involved. It's you and me. That's democracy. Yeah, it's that's right. average people. And that's why I'm such a big believer in, in local politics. And that's where it starts. Uh, if we get enough people, good people running for office, coming together at the local level, starting to slowly reclaim their lives, their communities, then you can really build a grassroots movement. There are no, I, I know you know this, Cliff, there are no shortcuts in life. No. Um, um, so again, it starts with attitude and saying, you know what, I want to take control of my life, but it is work. It's, yeah. it's, it's so much hard work. Um, and there's going to be failures, and you just got to pick yourself up and, and keep going, and never give in to the naysayers. Do you um, have? Uh, you must have pretty good name recognition. You must be pretty well known around the community. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, so with the, with the name, I'm I'm sort of leading with uh, with the tagline, kind of uh, on my yard signs. I sort of really highlight Ted because um, you know the last name is very difficult, so it's sort of yeah, like yeah. votes for Ted. Um, but yeah, as you said, it's a completely unique name. We, we literally, our family are the only ones in the world that have this name. It, it has its roots, um, Hungarian, uh, from trans the Transylvania portion of hung Hungary, which is now part of Romania. That's kind of history. Yeah. Uh, when Hungary lost Transylvania after the world wars, but, um, but you know, I'm proud of my history. Um, and you know, I, you know, I know we talked a little bit before the, the show, uh, Cliff, a little bit about another thing, of, in addition to where we grew up in Buffalo, a little bit about uh, shared history in the sense of, um, you know, I'm first generation hung Hungarian. My parents, uh, all my aunts and uncles, all my family, they all grew up in communist Hungary. So to sort of get more into about what are the deeper things that are driving me and motivating me to run for mayor and just be very involved and active and thinking about our politics and worried about where we're headed as a society and want to try to make positive change is again, it's all those stories that are ingrained in my life right? about those horrors that my family faced growing up in a communist country behind the iron curtain in yes. Hungary. Again, that is one of the importance of immigration in the United States yeah. reminding us of, of the truly difficult, um, and horrendous types of governments and, and things that are going on around the world and true and the beacon of hope that the United States is it, it, it sounds cliche sometimes, but it really is true. And I, you know, I have firsthand knowledge, you know, sitting at the dinner table, hearing my father, my uncle talk about politics, even though my father was a, you know, he's a traditional hardcore union man. So he's a traditional Democrat, my uncle being the sort of traditional uh, self-made businessman Republican and just sitting back there as a kid we would have they would they would talk and debate and argue for our hours talking about um, not just politics in America but their lives growing up and I uh, I absorbed this all one takeaway was how people with opposite viewpoints can scream at each other throw I mean just you know be so passionate but at the end of the day we're all family and come together and joke and realize hey be empathetic to both sides but anyways the the, the the deeper point about you know hearing stories that you know like my father doesn't really want to talk about about still being in high school and my grandfather kicking him out of the house and saying go i may never see you again but you need to try to escape get to america yeah wow. and getting yeah. captured and being in an internment camp for a year maybe more in, in Serbia as a teenager and the horrors he experienced there. And, and again, all my, all those experiences, my, my mother being born in a bomb shelter during world war two. Wow. And, and again, just the horrors of the, of the Russian sh soldiers coming into the villages at oh. unannounced terrorizing people in Hungary. And I, I don't even want to repeat the, the, the stories. Um, but again, these are the things ingrained in me and so many people and and I, it's not surprising that a lot of us with with these type of stories are at the leading edge of trying to get more people to yes understand the date sort of the in some ways the dangerous road we are on to uh, the, yeah. this, the whole censorship and I'm, I'm a big believer in the First Amendment and the big need for open debate and and again just knowing how close. We, we, you can sleep into that type of society. You you see yeah, the yeah. I was talking to you earlier about because my wife was you know came from Cuba at, at age six and her dad similar to your story, you know her her father was in the military and then uh, they liked him 
And so they actually told him one day, don't, don't come to work tomorrow. Because they, he finds out later they were executing his friends. They, they shot him and killed him. Yeah. And so, and you know, and he, there was a time, uh, they came in 71. So there was a time where they were allowed to, you know, sign up to leave the country and come to America. He had sponsors over here. He had relatives. But of course, you know, it's just funny. And, the, and you know that perspective that my wife has where, you know, so then they come to your house, right? And they take an inventory of everything you have. And, you know, when they come back before you leave, you better have every pencil that you, you that they saw. Yeah. And then you have to sign over everything. You know, you leave with like twenty dollars in your pocket. And uh, but you know, he didn't care. He just wanted to come to, to America. He just saw, like you say, that beacon of freedom meant more than you know. And you know, Cuba's a beautiful place, beautiful beaches, no crime. You know, but right. the, hey, freedom is more important to, to. It was more important to him than any of those things. Absolutely, and and I and I, I and I think a lot of people don't really realize how far along the road we've gone down the, the censorship road yes yeah. we know it's 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 quite it's widely known that okay yeah there was censorship related to covid and vaccinations and, and, and those sorts of things i'm telling you with firsthand knowledge it's gone way past that yeah i've been i've been censored in, in facebook and i've been deplat i was kicked off youtube uh um i was i've been censored in our local paper of record and not related to views to COVID or vaccinations. I I didn't have an opinion piece printed in 2021 criticizing or talking about the tax problems in Amesbury. That was censored. Wow. I'm not allowed to talk about taxes in Amesbury. Wow. I had a, uh, as one of my sort of random bits of activism I did, a few months ago, I just did sort of like a man on the street sort of thing in Amesbury where I just wanted to talk to average ordinary people. I had my cell phone. I had the most beautiful conversation with complete strangers, totally off the cuff. And we talked about sort of similar to what we're doing here about motivation and overcoming challenges in life. These were gentlemen that were had fallen on hard times um, related to drug, alcohol, abuse and 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 they're they're yeah. beautiful men they had beautiful stories to tell they're willing to tell a total stranger to me about their life story they were opening up yeah nothing to do we had no conversation about there was no conversation focused on covid vaccinations anything like that i post this video on youtube this beautiful story about overcoming and try to better your life it's taken down it's censored with no explanation now it's up there on rumble but again, there are so many examples that people don't realize how far we've gone down this road of, of First Amendment violations. Yeah. Of, there's so much information that's being silenced out there that people don't realize way beyond what people think it is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's certainly one of the motivations of running for mayor. Um, it sickens me that that type of mentality of trying to cancel people of trying to ruin people's lives, of shutting people's speech down. We need to be talking about so many issues. Yeah. Uh, and, and sort of the fourth, so if I can sort of get into the cliff, that's sort of like the, the baseline area of running for mayor and what I'd like to do. And, and um, so beyond sort of the traditional areas I talked about, um, you know, we have a absolute mental health crisis in this country. Uh and um, and again, this this is something I want to bring up and really truly try to tackle as mayor of Amesbury. Um, I want to set up aggressive task force, not sort of like committees that are going to kind of talk about things in a theoretical way. And then it's I want aggressive, proactive task force of of proactive people from wide variety of spectrums how can we address this because this kind of goes hand in hand with the with the uh, eroding of our rights and and sort of where we are as our democracy is there a problem in amesbury with that do you have, do you have uh, you, you see that there i see it well i think it's everywhere but certainly and i'll get into this a little bit i'm i'm speaking from personal experience again everything i talk about yeah i can speak passionately about because i'm speaking from personal experience so Yes, I, I walk around Amesbury I, or wherever I go, I can see it in so many people's eyes, the pain and the hurt, the unnecessary amount of suffering that's going out there. And it's beyond sort of the difficulties of living in a 
you know, the high cost of living and, and all the challenges we face. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about at a base level, the mental challenges we are facing. I want to, I want to bring my personal experiences and, and go beyond the typical cliches. I'm tired of hearing the, the, the typical status quo supposed solutions because they're not working. Things are getting scary worse. And, I, and again, in a household with, I have kids in my household age 15, 14, 13, and 11. So I am in the thick of it, of what kids are dealing with. And yeah. they're all in public schools. The scariness of social media so, again, I was at a place 10 years ago, uh, and again, I'm not shy to talk about anything about what I've experienced. I think leaders need to be, I think a lot of people need to be brave in coming out and speaking about their own troubles and, yes. and overcoming their challenges. Because truly, mm -hmm. when I tell you that, that, old, that whole cliche about, um, and this is really kind of the final big thing I, I hope to get across, um, that whole cliche about not wor wishing the worst thing on your enemy. Right. It, it truly is when it comes to deep depression and when you get to a place of yeah. suicidal thoughts. I was at that place 10 years ago. Um, and again, the, you, you truly cannot understand what it takes no. to get out of it, why a person gets into that place, unless you've been there and you've overcome. Yeah, I have a, someone um, very close to me who has a similar, and it was like being in a deep pit and uh yeah, so you have that perspective. That's great. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I've ov I've overcome chronic physical ailments. So supposedly, uh, uh, I had a, a disease, uh, colitis. I'll just say it. Yep. Oh, I have. You a know, all the doctors disease. said yep. that you know that it's incurable. You're gonna have to live with it for the rest of your life. You know, I just came to a point was I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm taking control of my life. I'm gonna overcome this. I did. Uh, but that that can't as as painful as that experience was. It it it, it pales in comparison to the absolute uh, physical uh, psychological torture of deep depression. It is the the best way I can describe it is, um, you know, because you're you're. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. But you you know, especially somebody like me who's sort of driven by passion and and advocacy and and who identifies as that being a per an important part of your life when you find yourself in a position in your life where you're surrounded by the wrong type of people uh, and you're in your you're in place in your personal life where you know basically my pilot light had extinguished i could feel it in my gut that that purpose for living and i didn't have the right support network around me anywhere and once that pilot light goes out it allows all the negative forces to just take over and it's like you're in you're in a room and there's a, a recording playing on the other side of the room 24 7 and it's the worst possible things on repeat that it says about yourself um, it's it's the most negative thoughts and no matter what you try to do you cannot turn that recording off so all the only uh, uh, resp you know the only freedom you get from that is sleeping or in some cases it gets to the point you just can't take that psychological torture anymore and you feel like you can't turn it off and people get to that that suicidal point. Um, we need to have, I feel like so much, so many people have lost the point of life. We, we don't have a purpose in life anymore. There's so many distractions um, and it's especially difficult for kids. We're making life so much unnecessarily complicated. Um, uh, our job as adults, parents, teachers, is to help clear the brush, make things clear for kids give them real purpose and, and meaning and show yeah. them the light. I feel like there's just so much crap being thrown at kids. And, yeah. again, and again, with social media, oh my God, I just can't even imagine. I, and I experienced it with kids in my house. It is so difficult these days. Yeah. And if you're in that place, you can't escape. None of us can escape being connected and everything. So anyways, I know what it takes to overcome it. I, I want to bring up that issue. Good, uh, good. I, I think I, and local I was communities... Asking you I was going to ask yep. you about the uh, if you're experiencing that because, you know, and in, and I don't know if this is good or bad. So like uh, my little hometown where my mom is still, she just turned 88. So she's she still lives in the same village. And then I have a friend here who is from uh, Skinny Atlas area of New York. And then uh, and he's like three hours, two hours away from there from here. And so he was talking about, well, I have, a, you know, I have like five vehicles in my yard and somebody wanted to borrow my truck. And I told him, just go down there. The keys are in it. 
And it's like my mom hasn't locked her door in probably 20 years. I mean, and so yeah. some, you know, people are living in like the way America was. I don't know if that maybe leads to apathy or because or, they're not really, well, that's happening in New York City, but where, where we're at, I mean, we haven't had a burglary in 20 years. I mean, but, you know, and I'm, I'm, I imagine it's pretty safe where you're at, right? Yeah, no, I'm fortunately, uh, for the most part, um, unlike maybe some bigger cities, um, the issue is crime. Issue of crime is not really um, at you know at that first level as I talked about, like property yeah. taxes and school. Fortunately, Amesbury is a relatively safe place. But again, no community is safe from right. That's right. And, and that's something that you know communities need to be uh, aware of about yeah. crime or or that sort of thing. But you're right. You know, my wife and I we try to we try to instill as many old school values in our kids as possible. I think trust is a huge thing. Again, I talk a lot about not living in fear. I mean, we try to raise our kids as free range as possible. Again, that's so difficult in modern life. I mean, we're all being monitored and you, you let your kid do something that, whoa, whoa, that's, oh, that's not safe. And, um, whole, but you know, you've got to allow some freedom for kids. We got to give them some breathing space yeah, you're right. for them to find themselves. Correct. Kids don't have the opportunity to just sit back, be quiet, be in nature, just be with other kids or with themselves without the super, constant supervision of schools or their parents or social media. That is so important. That's the only way for kids to truly develop a true identity and true um, confidence in themselves. We're, we're developing all this fake confidence that is eventually going to grow up and uh, blow up in people's faces. You can't get confidence via, uh, you know, Snapchat and, and social media and, and right. constantly forcing it on kids and constantly micromanaging everything that they do. So my wife and I, I think along the lines of what you're saying, we, we try to not live in fear. We, I remember we had, we sell uh, wood on the side of our road. Um, yeah. you know, cause we, we had, we got some, we got a decent number of trees. So I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll cut up the tree and just, you know, it's nice to, to sell for $5 a bundle, see people drive by and it's an honor system. And I remember, you know, we, we told people, they're like, well, how do you collect the money? Well, we're like, well, it's just an honor system. The amount of people were like, well, how many people, how many people are going to steal from you? Now we're just like, well, we're, we're trusting, we're trusting that people yeah, are going to exactly. be good. And I can say for honestly, for the three years we've done it, we've made quite a bit of money. Not a single person in the three years has taken advantage of it. Everyone has paid yeah. the amount or they've given more money. But it's unbelievable how, how many people's knee jerk reaction is. Well, you can't do that. You you can't trust people. They're they're yeah. gonna steal from you. Well, we're trusting and we're not gonna live in fear. And that's, that's the right. way we wanna live. Yeah, you have to man, that's the and that's the big uh, divider that they use. It's funny. Do you know M Michelle Tafoya that used to be on the uh, ESPN and she was a sideline yes. reporter? Well, yes. you know, she quit that job and now she's got her own. And she she basically said, I'm, I'm going to go on the front lines of education because I know a lot of parents are afraid to do it because obviously they can suffer some some severe consequences. But she just kept seeing in her own kids schools like they were bringing they were taking kids and putting them in their own groups right and separating instead of letting everybody come together and she was just thinking right. it was so indoctrinating that she, she she so she's taken on this fight and i really think a lot of her but kind of going along with what you oh. said you're very involved in your kids education and what's going on with them yeah and, and uh you've got to be uh yeah i mean you got to be your kid's principal uh uh, educator and don't follow the mainstream narrative necessarily. No. You, you, you know, in your heart, what is right, what is true and right. And don't be shy to talk about topics with kids, but at the same time, you know, let them be kids and run off and do their thing but to kind of go back to a little bit of what you just said. I absolutely hate identity politics. Um, I think that is one thing, one of the things that's absolutely tearing apart our society. Yeah. Um, as I said, I can talk to anybody, no matter where they are, and I truly believe it boils down to me for this when it comes to identities, politics, and groups of people. No matter how you want to slice people up, and we know the establishment and the mainstream of society constantly wants to group us into ever more and more different types of groups. No matter what demographic you are part of, black, white, rich, poor, gay, straight, it doesn't matter. I truly believe this in my heart, that every group of people has a roughly equal share of good, positive people, and every group of pe 
people, no matter what they are, has an equal share of assholes. Okay. Yeah, you're right. And yeah. my and my and my goal in life, I want nothing to do with the latter group. I try to avoid them as much That's as right. possible. Yep. I want to be around people that are a joy to be around, that are a pleasure to talk to, um, that are going to help help open me up to new ideas and help grow my and help my journey and, and yeah. who are open to me, hearing my points of view. And I don't care what who you are, uh, how much money you have, how poor you are, what you know, what color skin you are, what your sexual orientation are. I don't. I don't care, and I don't think we need to. We should be so hyper focused on those things, and somehow think that one group is evil, one group is great. Every group is the same. We're all people. We all within us have good and evil, um, and we all just got to try to find that positive light. And 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 truly, in this run for mayor, I just want to find wherever they are those good, positive, proactive people no matter what their beliefs are at the national political level or at the local level or what have you, I know I can work with anybody and I just want to make, you know, positive right. change, but yeah. I know it's, I, it's not, this is not all at the same time. I'm not scared to obviously speak my mind and, and say and do what needs to be said. you got to be a strong leader. Yeah, and obviously right. I'm not afraid to do that given how much I've been censored and how many people in power do despise me here locally because I am unfiltered. Because I know that what need that's part of the whole equation of us, yeah, of being able to overcome the challenges. You, you, we have to call out power structures, all of them. If, if they're to power, if exactly. they're bureaucratic, if they're yeah. if they're lying to us, we've got to find the truth. Yeah. Hey, let okay. me ask you this, because uh, I and I, you're a little bit younger, but because you know when I grew up, and I assume that, I, and I assume that my dad must have been conservative or Republican, but we never talked about that. He was a Marine and a police officer, and but he had like an album of JFK speeches and who, JFK probably would have been considered a, a con, far right today. But, but uh, when I grew up, no one knew what anybody voted for and no one knew, I, I don't know who you're, what uh, affiliation you're with. And I grew up on the, uh, in upstate New York at a sheriff's department. I remember them saying, oh, that's Tom. He's, he, he's our token Democrat or whatever. But no one ever yeah. asked me, the sheriff who was an elected official never asked me, are, are you registered or did you vote for me? It just wasn't, it, it wasn't talked about, you know? You went in and t pulled the curtain and you voted who you were gonna vote for, but now right. everybody's hyper are you, hey, can we be good friends? Well, it depends, I mean, if you're a Trumpster, no, we can't be, what? what? I mean, it's just a, such yeah. a division. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, again, I don't shy for anything, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody know I'm an open book, you know? I, yeah. I like the majority of people. I am an independent, so I'm not part of the Democratic Party. I'm not part of the Republican Party. Uh, I am a true independent. But number one, you're right. Uh, it is frustrating how just it's the knee-jerk reaction. Whoever you support at the national level, that sort of frames what they think you are at the local level. And as I explained at the top of this podcast, it's apples to oranges. National politics and and what's important at the local level is so different. But but fine. Yeah. But you, you can't escape it. People want to know. I know. Yeah. So again, I I am supporting RFK Jr. at the national level. Yeah. Um, and not surprisingly, that is the thing that immediately the local paper of record, they have still not reached out to me, one wow. time to, to ask me anything. Jeez. But they've already put a hit piece out me out to me, simply on that point. Yeah. Now to your to your point again, um, I'm not a. I wouldn't call myself a Trumper, but I certainly have sympathy to the Trump the principles, base. right? Policy. It's the not, principles, it's, there's yes, a lot of things I don't like so, about him, but I like some of his policies. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is where we are. So we know, uh, you know, Trump has got, got roughly 50% of the electorate, right? According to the high society. Yeah. 50% immediately. Uh, you know, they're a basket of deplorables. They're undesirable. They should be canceled 50% right. right off the bat. Now, here comes RFK Jr. from the traditional left. And again, to me, RFK Jr. is the real, actual, yeah. true liberal, true Democrat. The, to me, the Democratic establishment has been hijacked by this hijacked. Neo liberal. Correct. Hijacked. So I love that RFK Jr. is running for a Democrat because think about this. If somebody came and, and, and uh, so robbers came to your house and kicked you out of your house, what should you do? Should you run away, run to another town? No, you fight to get your house back. Correct, yeah. So 
But I love that RFK Jr. is trying to fight and say, no, this is the real base of the, of the, of the Democratic Party. So all these people who say, well, why is he doing? He's got no chance. No, he's kicking out the, the fake Democrats that have Correct. hijacked, the corporate yeah. Democrats that have hijacked the party from its true roots. Yeah. But now, and you, you see how they're coming after RFK Jr. now. Oh, man. So now, roughly, a couple, couple of key points. At the national level, right now, the key stats show that you ask all the electorate, the Republicans, independents, and uh, Democrats, RFK Jr. has the highest favorability of anybody. But let that go. Let's just look at the Democratic primary base. He's rough. He's polling roughly 20%, which is pretty amazing going up against a sitting president. But you take Trump's 50% of the electorate. Now, RFK Jr.'s 20% of the electorate, which the mainstream is now declaring is also worthy of canceling and, and deplorable so now we've got 70% of the voting electorate that supposedly we've we've it's things are so absurd with our cancel culture and the and the canceling of debate and what's considered acceptable uh, views to have at the national level that literally now we're to the point that 70% of the voting electorate is considered you know a basket of deplorables uh, that is ridiculous how do you expect to have a healthy democracy or, or bring people together so again. Number one, I have the totally different point of view. Again, whatever they're talking about, Trump, Biden, RFK Jr., these are important discussions to have at the national level, and people should be paying attention to that. But to your point, we could still be getting along and Correct. trying to have yeah. a healthy community where at the local level, none of those conversations really matter. Uh, it's all about how can we, as I said, have safe streets and maintain property taxes and have sc good school districts. Those aren't partisan issues, and that what should be focused on Correct. first and yeah. foremost. But, not but unfortunately, too many people are focusing on that national yeah. Trump, Biden, RFK stuff. When, it, when is the is election for for mayor? In November. Uh, the final election is November nine. As of now, I think officially that's the only uh, uh, election. However, if there's more more than two people that are running for be mayor, a primary or, yeah. there'll have to be a primary. I believe you. it's it's September. I think it's September 17th. So I think officially the deadline to return the signatures is coming up. It's in about nine days. Uh, so, so far as of now, I believe just the sitting mayor and myself have returned. So I think officially there's just a, a November election. But there's, Great. there's there's been talk about three other people who have pulled papers who may jump into the race. So this things might be coming up really quickly. But I'm I'm getting I'm entering the heart of the campaign really here. I'm I'm starting this weekend. I'm going to start going right. door to door, um, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm doing everything that that I can possibly do. Well, we're going to start to wrap up here, but I'm going to pay attention. I wish I could vote for you. I, I can tell that we're on uh, similar paths, and you're someone who cares. You're authentic. You're willing to be vulnerable. You're already embedded in serving the community. So, man, I'm hoping the best for you. And because they, they, as you've said, you. You come from a positive uh, way of uh, thinking of things. And obviously, even if someone didn't agree with you, you'd be open to listen to them and, and discuss the matter, which is something that uh, is not Absolutely. really common today. So any last thoughts before? Uh, and I, let's get together again, because I feel like there's a few things we could talk about for four hours here. <laughs> yeah, no, um, you know, as you could tell, I'm a, I'm a very passionate person. You know, Absolutely. talking with my wife, she was like, she knows I have a tendency to try to cram too much information i just there's so much i want to talk about no, um, no, but yeah. yes thank you for this final there is Absolutely. one final thing i, I want to oh. plug because i i wanted to mention this while i had the opportunity because i i feel so strongly about this and again it's related to personal experience and everything but along that the path of, of the mental health and i'll, and I'll yeah. I promise try to be brief as possible sure um one of the most uh underappreciated reasons i believe for mental health problems in children today it's totally under the radar not talked about allowed to be talked about at the mainstream level think about the number of families that are, are children that are growing up in a divorced household right now compared to like 30 years ago divorce in and on itself is not necessarily the problem but in way too many cases it is so contentious and the way that the family court system is set up it almost encourages it and certainly there are situations and it god bless the families where you have two good where you have parents that are decide to divorce 
and they and they want to you know they want to make it as easy and on the child as possible not get into a very contentious area and they want to truly co-parent unfortunately there's a lot of children that are not fortunate to have a situation like that and people do not understand i talked about the nightmare world of of being in a place of se severe depression it's almost, I would not wish on my worst enemy if you get into the vortex of the bureaucracy of family court system where you can be in there for 10 years, drain all your money, spinning the wheels over the most unbelievable, you would not believe the most petty things. And the best way to describe um, what is com what needs, the, the issue that needs to be become aware aware of by people involved with the family court. The best phrase is coercive control. Um, there's been a good awakening over the past few years. I think people understand the dangers of more traditional blue collar, although I don't think it's blue collar, but it's viewed as blue collar physical abuse and the dangers there. There is so much mental abuse, narcissistic type of gaslighting mental abuse that is going on that is exacerbated by the family court system. And if you unfortunately have very bitter exes, and, to, and that's not gonna be uh, uh, unusual, there are so many ways for coercive control where one ex-spouse could literally, I know I don't say this word uh, lightly, could become the slave of the other ex-spouse through extensive monitoring social control there's so this would take two hours to really go through but i just yeah. wanted to bring yeah, that up time yeah and and uh, you know i'm part of an advocacy of that to try to raise raise awareness yeah, here in massachusetts good. at the state level about the issue of co coercive control raising that awareness in family court and, and that's an underrated source of tension for children and mental health so thank you for giving me that opportunity and and thank you for this opportunity as a whole yeah. i mean you know your pet you know i think your podcast is great i saw your podcast with uh pete berwick my friend yeah. um thank you, know, you so i thought much. it was a fantastic conversation so thank you yeah well i love yeah it's uh and so uh is there any links that anybody can look for your campaign or uh, we can point them to it or any anything i can uh include in show notes or on the youtube uh description yeah, so the quickest one would be uh, reclaimamesbury.org. That would be my principal website. On there, there's a donation link. Uh, there's a link to my Facebook page. So that, I would say that would be my, my principal thing. I've, you know, I've got my phone number, my email. I'm open to people reaching out. Um, but So it's reclaimamesbury.org. Okay, so I'm going to include that in the show notes of any of the podcast uh, platforms and also on the YouTube Channel description will be reclaimamesbury.org, and you can uh, please go there uh, if you just want to know about uh, Ted's campaign, or please support him. Uh, man, I, I love what you're doing. We're, we're kind of out of time here, but I hope we get back together, and uh, man, you're a great guy, and uh, and uh, so we have a lot in common, and we could keep talking, like I say, but uh, let's get back together again, and I'm going to watch your campaign. Hopefully the next time, and uh, we're going to be have a little celebratory uh, podcast here on your on your win. That, that would be fantastic. And again, I love, I love your energy. I, lo I love what you're doing here. So you know, I, once again, thank you so much. I, I oh, agree. Back really at appreciate you, Ted. it. Ted Semezny. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Yes. And uh, please hang around for the debrief. I'm going to end. So that's it, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Cliff Yates Show. You're in the right place, as always. See you next time.